Okay, hello everyone. I want to start with sharing one of my biggest frustrations with you. But I want to introduce that by asking two questions. So I want to see some hands. Who of you does regular code reviews? Say, at least once a week. Okay, good. Um, so who of you has ever pointed out common coding guidelines during this code review? Okay, this is directly related to my frustration. Because when a colleague of mine opens a pull request and I start reviewing, I find myself repeatedly pointing out the same things over and over again. This can vary from either uh, common coding guidelines, some subtle bugs, or some code style issues. And the fact that I, uh, for example, have to, for the fourth time that week, have to point out the same thing annoys me. So I start wondering, hey, can't we actually start automating this? Well, my name is Rick Ossendrijver, and today I'm going to show you how we can actually start uh, automating away this problem. So the title of the talk is Automating Away Bugs with Error Prone in Practice. And error prone is the tool that we're going to use uh, for this. I'm a software engineer in the Java platform team at Picnic. And Picnic is an online supermarket based in the Netherlands. We are active in three countries, namely the Netherlands, Germany, and France. And we have over 3 million customers uh, spread over these countries. So um, first, I'm going to give a little bit more context on Picnic and some uh, pro tell you something about the processes that we have uh, resolving around code uh, quality. I will introduce to you error prone. After that, I'm going to show you how you can actually start using error prone in your code base, because that, that's really the goal of today's talk. Uh, and after that, I'm going to show you how we use error prone uh, at Picnic, and uh, I, will, I will share some best practices and some lessons learned. So um, for our customers, Picnic, um, they use the Picnic app. They can order all their groceries there. Uh, they choose a specific time slot. And then um, how it works is that our delivery, uh, we have uh, someone who does the deliveries in these uh, cute electric vehicles that you see here on the right. It is a cartoonish version, but um, you get the idea. So the customer only sees our app and the person who does the actual delivery. But of course, you can imagine that to power and power this whole system, a lot of software is involved. And we write all our software in-house. And um, because we still want to heavily expand uh, to other countries, because we want to become the online supermarket of Europe, we need to uh, yeah, build a lot of new features and extend to other countries as well. So our code quality needs to be really high because um, yeah, we need to extend and uh, build new features. So we are aiming for the most excellent code quality. But when I hear code quality, I always need to think about this image, where the amount of WTFs per minute is an, is a, gives you an idea of how good the code is uh, that is being reviewed. Well, but kidding aside, I actually mean that we are striving for the most excellent code quality within Picnic. And of course, we uh, use uh, the review process, uh, amongst other things, for that. Uh, we have a very strict review process where we are really looking, hey, is this the code that we actually want? Does it what, is, uh, what it is supposed to do? We focus on a good architecture such that, such that it is really extensible and flexible uh, for our needs. But we also uh, believe that having the least amount of possible bugs in our code and having a really consistent code base allows us to be able to move a lot faster than traditional supermarkets, because we simply have no physical stores that uh, customers can go to. So because we are still going to grow a lot, we need to write a lot of code, and that needs to be reviewed. So one of the things that we really try to focus on is automating parts of this code review process. And one of the goals for that is to limit the amount of bike shedding that is happening. What do I mean by that? Well. Bike shedding is a term for discussing uh, very trivial things that are really not that important, while you should actually focus on the things that are more important. So the, the, yeah, the trivial things is discussing the color of the bike shed, while you should focus on the things that are more important. And um, what I want to say is that it's not really bad to have a discussion, uh, especially within your team or within the company, but when you make a decision, you should make sure that that decision is enforced over your whole code base such that that discussion cannot happen again. Let's say you have in your team a specific code style, and, uh, and you have a new joiner in your team, and he's like, hey, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? And you, have to, you need to have all these discussions again. Well, that is wasting time. Let me show you an example of this. 
Let's say you're reviewing a, a pull request and someone changes method A from me to method B, while well, both methods do exactly the same thing. In this case, it's about the string dot is empty uh, that is rewritten to the equals uh, with an empty string. And another colleague comes in and says, hey, uh, I thought we agreed on using method A instead of using method B. And what you can see is that there are a few uh, upvotes on, on this comment. So this can easily trigger a whole new discussion. And that is, uh, this is an, uh, a perfect example of something that we do not want, because this is very local in a pull request uh, within your team. And this is the, the thing that we should actually automate and, and, and force over our whole code base, so uh, the discussion is not possible. There are a few tools uh, in, that we use, and I'm going to take you through them, uh, that are focused on limiting the amount of bike setting that's happening. So, one of the easiest uh, is the use of a formatter. Internally, we use the Google Java format, a fairly opinionated formatter, so no discussions possible about where to put the curly bracket, either on a new line or the same line as a class definition. Another uh, type of tools that we use are the static analysis tools. So, yeah, for example, SonarCloud, Checkstyle, and Spotbugs. And these uh, tools are yeah, the industry proven best practices. We also use them internally, and they can find uh, nice bugs in your code, and you can fix them. But they have a limitation. Take, for example, SonarCloud. If you would go to your SonarCloud dashboard, it would almost directly scream at you, hey, you have over 40 days of technical depth. You should immediately fix this. Well, you're like, hey, I'm working on this high priority feature. I'm definitely, definitely not going to take a look at uh, the technical depth that you're uh, mentioning. So in practice, nothing really happens, and the technical depth stays there. And that is a big limitation. So we want to take it one step further. And that brings us to the next part. Namely, uh, allow me to introduce you to error prone. So error prone is an open source static analysis tool uh, for Java. It can find and detect bugs in your code, but it can also provide a suggested fix for you based on uh, your actual code. And if you run error prone in patch mode, it will automatically apply the fixes for you. How does that work? Well, let's say you have a Java, Java class and the compiler starts compiling the code. And at some point it is done, it has a lot of extra context available, uh, the type resolution, and it did a lot of checking. And right after that, error prone can kick in and can use that additional context to do a much more thorough analysis. But error prone has a link to the actual source code. So if you run it then in patch mode, it can say, hey, I found a bug in your code, and it will automatically apply uh, the fix in your actual source file. That means that if you would enable a specific bug pattern, an error prone check, it would uh, analyze your whole code, by code base, find all violations, and then automatically apply all the fixes for you. So the bug cannot occur in your code base again. And that's what makes error prone really powerful. Out of the box by Google, there are over 500 error prone checks provided. Um, and you can configure them just as you like them uh, to be configured. Like there are three types of severities. You have error, uh, suggestions, and warnings. And you can override the severity, of course, and you can disable specific checks if they do not work for your code base, for example, based on the technologies that you use. Or uh, there's one downside to error prone, however, and that is that if you want to write a check your, uh, of your own, it can be quite complex because you have uh, to work with the abstract syntax tree, for those of you who know. But uh, the guys at Google thought about this and they created another tool on top of error prone. And that tool is called Refaster. With Refaster, you can specify refactoring operations using before and after templates. Let me show you an example to make it more clear. So we have uh, here, we have a simple before template where we specify what code we want to match. And in the after template, if we would uh, run refaster in patch mode, then it will automatically rewrite the code for us. So here's an example of a condition in an, uh, in an if statement. And if we would then apply this refaster rule, then it would automatically get rewritten to this, but then over your whole code base, of course. There is one downside to using refaster, and that is that it is limited because it can only uh, do rewrites uh, in um, expressions and statements, which generally means inside method bodies. So now that you know what error prone and refaster are, I actually want to show a little demo. But before I do, I need to explain two uh, Maven profiles. 
Um, and I also have a link here, which will also be on the, the last slide uh, with the actual demo code. Um, I will, sh I will um, show a few examples, but all of them are based on Maven. But uh, please know that error-prone also works for other build systems like Bazel and Gradle. Um, so we'll work with Maven, but I need to explain uh, two uh, profiles that we're going to add to the build in order to understand how this works. So we have our normal build, and on top of that we will add, uh, for example, this profile, and that is the error-prone profile. If we uh, do a Maven build and we pass minus p error prone, then it will add this configuration. So what, it will, what you see here is that it is a, a Maven compiler plugin, and uh, we can here um, add the configuration to enable error prone and to co configure it just like we want it. So we say, okay, minus x plugin error prone, which enables it, and here's a very simple example of how we disable a specific check. Because in this case, we don't target JDK8, so we say, okay, we don't want this check. But here we can add a lot of configuration. To run all the uh, error-prone checks in patch mode, we have a different profile, namely the patch profile. So here we have the patch profile saying, hey, um, I want the patch location of the fixes, that of, the, of the, how do you say that? The, um, if you find a violation, you have a suggested fix, and the patch location is in place, meaning in the actual, uh, updating your actual source code in your source file. But uh, you can also provide uh, patch checks, and then uh, what happens is that if you pass a specific error-prone check, it will only patch, for example, that uh, check that you pass uh, that you pass to the patch args. We will use this later on. Okay, so now let's go to the demo. Okay, I have a very simple clause here, and I'm going to ask you uh, to point out some things that, uh, of which you think, hey, this can be improved or should actually be different. So if you see something in each method, there is something that can be improved. So please, can you read it or? Yeah, okay. Good one, so we can maybe rewrite that. Yeah, let's see uh, in a second. Uh, other ideas for the other methods? Yeah, we at Picnic are really fan of immutability, so we use the immutable. We prefer the immutable set. But uh, <laughs> sorry. Indeed, we're doing here a copy off of something that is already immutable set. Any takers for the for the first method? That's not what I was uh, after, but... Uh, okay, let's see what error-prone says. Maybe uh, it finds something. We scroll up a little bit. And ah, we see that uh, there are a few things. So a refast rule in uh, detected indeed a, a refactoring opportunity the, um, in the at the bottom. Is instead of the length, uh, the dot is empty. And the other one is on line uh, 10, where we uh, have the new illegal argument exception. It says, hey, that exception, exception created but not thrown. Did you mean throw new illegal argument exception? Um, and there is a link to the actual, uh, to the documentation where you can see some extra information on this. And the other one is indeed the identity conversion. Uh, this method invocation appears redundant. Uh, did you mean return set? Okay, it found some nice things. But now we want to use the magic of error prone by saying, hey, minus p patch, enabling us to run the uh, bug patterns in patch mode. And what we see now, if I click here, indeed, the throw keyword is added, and we see that the uh, uh, copy off is uh, omitted, and we have the string dot is empty. So the examples I showed here are fairly trivial, uh, but, but I want to show you, uh, I want to explain some other uh, bug patterns that error prone has. So there is a, um, a website where you can see uh, information on all the 500 bug patterns. Uh, yeah, th there's a link here. And um, now I'm going to show a few examples. So there is the incomparable uh, bug pattern, which goes over sorted collections and try to identify uh, types that are not implementing uh, comparable, because that's likely a bug. 
And another one is the uh, bad instance of. It can uh, go over your code and identify instance of um, usages that are um, that are for sure um, um, how do you say that evaluated to an actual null check or equivalent to a null check. Another one is the constant field bug pattern, uh, which will help you with enforcing naming patterns thr throughout your code base. Uh, if you are, if you have a field with a constant case, it uh, yeah, it should probably be a static final, and it will point that out for you. For the attentive uh, viewer, you can say, "Hey, check style also does this." Um, yes, that is true, but uh, remember that error prone can automatically fix all the occurrences for you, whereas check style can't. Um, now on to some more powerful uh, bug patterns. So. For this little story, I assume that in almost every team there is someone who's really a fan of immutability and is really keen on making sure that it is always really clear in the code, saying, hey, please add the final keyword here, add the final keyword there, because it's, it's uh, a constant variable that you're using. Well, as a result, uh, your code base gets quite cluttered with all these, uh, these final keywords. And uh, yeah, the thing is so that the default here is, is mutable unless um, you add the final keyword and then it is immutable. Well, error prone has a bug pattern uh, for us that allows us to completely flip the defaults here by saying, hey, we have a var um, annotation which says, okay, the, the default now is uh, a field is immu immutable, but if you add the var uh, annotation, then you know it is a mutable field. So uh, we can omit the final keywords because we assume that now everything is immutable. And if we are uh, changing a variable, if we have a, 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 a non-constant variable like here, because we're changing it here, then we add the advar keyword. And error prone will make sure that, that, uh, that this is enforced over your whole code base. So on to the next one. Error-prone can also help with uh, enforcing the correct usages of APIs or making sure that you are migrating to newer APIs. So for example, uh, the optional.get got introduced. Uh, a lot of people started using this, of course. And at some point, the optional.orls throw got introduced. The javadoc of the optional.get mentions, hey, you should uh, move to the, you should migrate to the .orls throw. Well, with one refaster rule, we can actually automatically uh, do apply this over our whole code base. Instead of having to fix this manually, which is uh, prone to errors and also um, yeah, costs a lot of time. And you can, uh, of course, miss uh, an occurrence in your code base. So with one refaster rule, this is completely solved. So now that you know what error prone is and how it works, I want to actually explain to you how you can start introducing it in your code base. Because if uh, you would uh, start using error prone, enable all the bug patterns, yeah, there are over 500 error, uh, bug patterns, so it would say, hey, I <laughs> if you would open a PR with all the, the bug patterns applied, you would have a lot of files changed and no one would want to review that, let alone uh, merge that and uh, get it into production. That is not going to happen. So we need to think about how we approach this. So I, um, yeah, I created a roadmap for that. Let's say you have your code base. And first, uh, what we need to do is we need to get to the baseline, which is level one. I explained the two Maven profiles. So uh, we need to add those to, uh, to our build, such that we are able to run error prone, and also that we are able to run specific bug patterns on our code base. So we add the two profiles, but we need to make sure that no, uh, no, none of the um, bug patterns is actually enabled. And from there, we can uh, start picking specific bug patterns from the documentation website, of which we think, hey, the team will actually like this, and it's a very clear improvement because this solves uh, many bugs in our code. So what you do, uh, you... Uh, are on a branch, you run uh, the command for enabling one specific bug pattern, and you run that over your whole code base. Then, by using git diff, you, in, you inspect the changes and are uh, going over it like, hey, is this something of which the other team members will also think this is a very good improvement? Will they like this, or will I get a lot of pushback? And of course, you um, need to make sure that you choose wisely uh, and, and pick out some good uh, bug patterns. Then you ask them for reviews, and, and this Process needs to uh, be re you need to reiterate over this. You need to uh, keep on enabling more bug patterns, such that others are um, are getting used to to these kind of pull requests, and that in an automated fashion these changes are being applied. 
and they need to get enthusiastic about the changes that you are introducing. And at some point, you, uh, from level two, you go to level three if all uh, default error checks are enabled, as is uh, specified on the, the documentation of error prone. It sounds nice, but how would, would this look like? Um, I have an example for you guys. So I went on GitHub and I looked for an open source repository and I found a nice one with over 200,000 lines of code. And I looked at it and I, I, I'm sure that that repository could really use some error prone. Um, it didn't even use a formatter, so I introduced that. I added the two Maven profiles. Um, and yeah, from that baseline, I'm going to show you how we can actually do this. So, as you, as you can see here, this is one of the two profiles that I added to the, to the, rep uh, to the repository. And now I want to show you the, uh, an example of how we can run such a check on this code base. It is fairly simple because you already saw some of this where we had the Maven clean package with uh, the minus p error prone, the minus p patch, and then the command to run one specific check on the code base. And in this case, I went for the unnecessary final because there were a lot of those in the repository. And it's actually as simple as running this command and it will go over our code and fix all the violations. Well, I want to press enter right now, but then we would wait uh, for several minutes. So I prepared a commit that I can easily cherry pick. Um, and for that, I do this. And uh, indeed, it now applied the patch a necessary final bug checker with over uh, with, with almost 800 files changed and over 4,000 changes. I'm now going to push that such that we can inspect the result, because uh, as this doing this is fairly easy, but uh, it also needs to be reviewed. But I want to show that reviewing this is fairly simple, as you make sure that the the commits are very um, uh, like topical, like that it is only one uh, bug pattern that is enabled. So. What we can now see is that indeed this commit is applied and uh, the final keyword is removed quite a lot of times. But as you can see when I'm maybe a bit bigger, this is good. Okay. What we can see is that if we go over, if we scan over this, it's fairly easy to review. Our brain is just pattern matching over the code and it's very clear what we are doing. And because it's automated, uh, we can have a, a um, and we can assure that it is um, yeah, done by a computer and not uh, that a lot of mistakes are made. Um, yeah, and, and if, we're, if we're agreeing with the changes, we, it's as simple as saying, hey, just create a pull request. We ask our team members to start reviewing uh, and we can merge the PR. And that is a process that we need to uh, repeat quite a lot of times. Yes. Which file will not be in the code, sorry? You removed the file, right? I removed the file. Yeah. I, uh, what do you mean in the, ch in the changes? Yeah. I it removes the final modifier because uh, error prone says it's not needed. Yes. So it will also be compiled that way. Yes. So, so okay. <laughs> Press flower. Mm -hmm. I do not fully get your question. Yeah. There, as of JDK 8, I believe the, the final keyword could remo be removed in these, uh, in these places and had literally no uh, effect. I mean, the effect of final detection is quite good, but it's not 100% the same as the other one. Um, there can always be edge cases, of course. Uh, for that, you, of course, also have tests, uh, I assume. And uh, yeah, you compile afterwards to check that everything is fine. Yeah? Okay, so uh, just to reiterate, we went from uh, the baseline enabled one specific check and that is the thing that we uh, need to reiterate over quite a few times until we get to the, to the next level. Okay, um, yeah, error prone at Picnic. At Picnic we have over 50 Java repositories and all these repositories have one common parent. And in that parent we have a lot of modules, uh, core modules, but we also maintain the, uh, the common configuration for a lot of static analysis tools. 
uh, amongst which is error prone. And uh, what we also have in, in all our repositories is a patch script. And in, when you invoke that patch script, uh, you will do a full build, and all the error prone checks will be enabled using the two profiles, and it will run in patch mode. But what, why that is convenient is that if you wrote some code, um, and before you will open a pull request, you invoke the patch script, it will analyze your, your, your code and see if there are any violations, and it will automatically fix that for you. But uh, this script uh, has more, um, is also really nice for our CI, because if a developer, for example, forgets to, um, to run this patch script, our CI, uh, if you open a pull request, always there, there will be a build and the patch script will be run. And if there are changes, we have a tool to uh, alert you for that. And that tool is called Danger. It will say, hey, there are uh, some errors, please check it out and run the patch script yourself. We do not automatically apply these changes because it's really important that the developer stays in control. And the developer also needs to check, hey, uh, is this actually correct? Are there edge cases? Uh, do I need to uh, take any action? And otherwise, uh, just commit the changes. But what is really nice about this setup is that once you enable a bug pattern and uh, you re resolve all the violations automatically, um, it will be automatically part of the build. So you can assume when a specific bug pattern is enabled that it can really not enter your code base ever again because if there, if there is a violation, the build will fail and you are not able to merge. So you don't need to think about it ever again, which is really nice. So I think by now it's really clear that uh, we at Picnic are really fans of error prone. Uh, because at, and at some point we thought, hey, we have all the bug patterns enabled. We want to do even more. We want to go even further and, and, and go to an ever more consistent and bug-free code base. Uh, one can dream. Um, so at some point uh, we created a repository and added a lot of these extra error-prone rules and refast rules to this repository. And at some point we had such a big, um, big code base well, we had um, a lot of rules in there, and we thought, hey, we uh, should actually share them with the rest of the community. And about half a year ago, we actually open sourced this repository. Um, the name of the repository is Error Prone Support, uh, and it contains over 750 refaster rules and over 40 error prone bug checks. And on the right, you see our mascot, uh, Cody the Code Buster. Everyone, meet Cody. Um, but yeah, uh, all, of these, um, all of these rules are focused on uh, making our code more consistent, catching some subtle bugs or anti-patterns. Um, and I'm going to show you some uh, examples of this. Uh, this is an example of a refaster rule where we have a s simple if uh, condition, and if that condition is met, then we say, hey, throw a new illegal argument exception. But we actually prefer the preconditions.check argument, so we rewrite all the occurrences because they're basically doing uh, one and the same thing. But we also have some more opinionated rules. And one of those is the flux flap map usage. So uh, if, you, um, if you are using a, a flux and you invoke a, a flap map with only one uh, parameter, uh, what happens under the hood is that implicitly there is a specific concurrency set for you which is not clear uh, when you look at it. So what happened within Picnic is that sometimes we had bug reports uh, that, that were really weir weird and hard to detect what, what was actually the problem. So at some point we said, okay, we disallow the flux uh, flat map usage with one parameter, because what you're probably trying to do is to use a concat map. And if you want to have concurrency, that is fine, but then you need to specify a concurrency you're on your own. So instead of uh, having this, we say, hey, you either use concap map or you specify a concurrency. So then it's really clear uh, that you know what you're doing and you actually want this concurrency. And this is an example of a more opinionated rule that we have internally. Well, it's open source, so we use internally. And we also, besides a lot of extra rules, we also have some more features on top of error prone because we made it a lot easier to run a lot of these refaster rules uh, on your code base. And we also have a test support module to make sure that you can uh, test what a refaster rule does, especially if you have so many. It's really convenient to know uh, that the uh, rewrite uh, is actually what you expect. Uh, 
And uh, at the beginning, we saw that uh, during the demo that a refos rule found a violation in our code and uh, showed a nice error message. Well, that is not supported out of the box by error prone, but we uh, improve, we created support for that uh, in error prone support. And uh, we also have a documentation website, and I can quickly show that one. So this is the, the homepage with just our readme, but the cool thing is that it, for our own bug patterns, it will actually show you in the terminal, hey, you can uh, see the documentation here, and it will actually link to our, uh, to our website. And uh, we, for example, introduce a check that is the direct return check, so you can see some extra information about this and some examples of what uh, things it will flag in your code base, so you can understand what it is doing. But we also have this for refos the rules. And to give you an idea on how much we like consistency, I have this example where there are many ways of checking whether a collection, uh, whether this immutable set is empty, and we rewrite them to all to be all very similar and only use the dot is empty operator. Um, yeah, there are examples for all uh, our refos rules here on the the website. So. We started writing error prone support, uh, but we didn't, uh, from, from, from the get go, we did not enable them all in our build by default. So at some point, we had a very uh, large battery of uh, rules, and we thought, okay, now we need to start applying them. But again, we have the problem that if we would enable them all at once, people were like, would be like, yeah, uh, this is way too much, it's not reviewable, I either disagree, uh, it, it would not work. So we again had to think, hey, how are we going to apply this? especially because there are a bit more uh, opinionated rules. There could be uh, pushback on some of the rules, of course. So we started opening a lot of pull requests in uh, many different repositories. So we created uh, over 60 uh, pull requests in many different repositories. And uh, here, here you can see some numbers of the sizes of the pull requests. Um, as you can imagine, uh, this boosted my GitHub stats quite a bit. Um, so in total, error support uh, rewrote over 33,000 lines of code. Um, but of course, when we uh, created such a pull request, we really thought about, hey, how can someone start reviewing this? Because we want it to be easy for the developers. So we created uh, pull requests that, that were structured like this. So we uh, created a lot of, we created many commits in one pull request such that the changes that we introduced were uh, split per topic. So uh, yeah, if a, yeah th that makes it a lot easier for the developers to review these changes. But of course, uh, having uh, a lot of teams uh, where we open these PRs, at some point there would be quite some pushback. And they would ask, hey, why are you introducing this change? Why do you think this is better than uh, the other thing? Well, the, the important thing first was to, uh, to make sure that they felt uh, heard and uh, that we, we provided explanations and asked, hey, thanks for your feedback, give an explanation, but that's, because we, especially because we did it in many different repos, we could see, hey, there's a little bit more pushback on these specific rules than on the others. Probably we need to do something with that. Well, and of course we did. Uh, so what we did is uh, we opened uh, polls in our Slack, and we would ask for a vote saying, hey, uh, we got some pushback and there's, some in there's an interesting challenge here. Uh, in this specific case, we have uh, three ways of writing one and the same thing, but we would like to have it consistent over our code base. What do you think? Do you agree with the change? Do you have a preference? Is there any downside to doing this? Please let us know. And that way, the developers were really involved with uh, the process and they could, they could actually be part of the process. And that's what they really liked about this. Most developers were like, ha, huh, yeah, I don't really care as long as you... Um, as long as you make it consistent, it's fine by me. And there, of course, were some developers who were really opinionated about it, and they could uh, they could use this for like discussions, which is good. Um, but yeah, uh, in general, we could just find a nice uh, consensus on something, and we could enforce it over our whole code base, which was uh, yeah really the goal of this. So. Um, the current state of error prone support is that um, I'm happy to say that all these rules are now applied on Picnic's Java code base and uh, they run as part of the build uh, by default. Uh, but as we ha talked about in the beginning, it was really the idea of getting other developers to contribute their ideas because they would 
um, be the one saying, hey, I am reviewing this, I have to point this out repeatedly, I don't want that. Let's automate this in such a way that it is applied over all uh, Picnic's Java code. Well, most developers needed, we needed, mo uh, we needed to incentivize most developers to actually contribute their ideas. So we used a really powerful mechanism for this, and that is that we created uh, custom stickers that they could uh, earn. So uh, we said, okay, uh, good idea, please make a contribution, and if you do that, you get a sticker. Uh, it sounds weird, it sounds stupid, but it actually works quite well. Uh, especially for the shiny one on the left, uh, that was for more contributions, it worked quite well. Um, so in a few months' time, we actually had over 30 uh, contributors. And um, yeah, as for external adoption, it also went quite well because uh, the guys from Checkstyle and an open source repository from Uber also um, run uh, our checks. And um, for, um, let me rephrase, uh, Ben Mains, the uh, maintainer of Caffeine, which is a very popular caching uh, library, he also uses uh, our checks. Uh, and of course, our GitHub issues are open for uh, good ideas. So, um, let me uh, wrap up a little. There are two perspectives here, really. You have the developers who are, in general, really happy with the things they are seeing. They get a lot of free, uh, good improvements, which they agree upon, and especially because they are really part of the process and can determine, they can influence what things are uh, getting rewritten. And that makes them really happy. But for, from a platform team or like configuration maintainers' perspectives, you need to uh, make sure that you tread lightly. You need, to make, you need to make sure that the things that you're introducing or the checks that you're enabling are actually good improvements and that the other developers are really uh, agreeing with you there because otherwise they would give so much pushback that at some point they will not upgrade and say, yeah, I, I, I'm not agreeing, I don't want this. So you need to make sure that what you are doing um, yeah, is perceived as, as good and uh, the right direction. So, um, if you think uh, that what we at Picnic do, uh, do is cool and uh, you would like to join well, or have questions, please, uh, I'm, I'm here afterwards to answer any kind of questions or you can go to the website. But uh, to wrap up my last slide, uh, there is here some, uh, there, here is the link to the GitHub page with the uh, demo code and uh, the QR code goes to the GitHub page of Airprone Pro Support. And uh, I want to give a special thanks to Stefan Schroevers, who is uh, one of the founding engineers at Picnic. He is really responsible for this error-prone mindset within Picnic and also uh, created error-prone support. Um, yeah, and with that, I want to thank you uh, for your attention. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions, maybe? Um, I have used it, but uh, as it is more like a, uh, it should more be used like a compiler plugin, such that if you do a build, it will run as part of that. Um, so we do not really use the, the compiler plugin of IntelliJ. Okay, the reason I say it is because if you're like uh, the lone voice of reason, yeah. And oh, sorry. Uh, it's a really good way to plug it in as a single developer uh, if you just want to see what Aeroprone has to use or, or you just want to get some good ideas on your code that yeah. you're doing. So it's like, at least my code doesn't have the finals in them. <laughs> <laughs> so for you, it's an easy way to sneak in some of the changes that Aeroprone does without mentioning Aeroprone did it basically. Exactly. Nice. You also want to get up statistics. Uh. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, great talk. Um, is there any way to mark a, a finding uh, as a false positive? Because if there is no no such possibility, you will have this uh, finding forever, forever making the the analysis uh, not true in the end, right? So that's the question. And um, very good question. It's very uh, you use uh, uh, the developers use the patch profile uh, mm, frequently. That's because we use uh, Sonar and, and we have the, the issues from Sonar, right? And we have to mark a not minor number of them as false positives or uh, 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 don't implement, not apply. And uh, uh, we suffered from uh, introducing bugs because developers 
following blindly the direction of sonar. Severe bugs were introduced. So I'm scared of things like patch that applies blindly, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, as blind as a uh, machine gun, the, these uh, findings. So two questions in one. Good, qu good Thank questions. You. Um, yeah, you can easily use a suppress warnings uh, mechanism to say just add suppress warnings and then the name of the bug pattern that uh, if you have like a, an edge case that should not be uh, uh, rewritten. And um, yeah, it really depends on the developer how often they use the, the patch uh, script. Um, but of course, that's why I mentioned that um, we do not auto commit the changes that are uh, found, found by the patch script. It's really up to the developer to see, hey, is this a clear improvement or not? Um, and another part, uh, another part of the answer is that um, in order to, especially, um, let me phrase it from the error-prone point of view. Um, error-prone only allows uh, allows you to add new bug patterns if there is a really a uh, low chance on false positives. Like they have a few rules that it uh, it should al in almost every case be a, a clear uh, improvement that it, that cannot really introduce any problems. So there is not this high amount of um, of suppressions that you need to add generally. Uh, within Picnic, we have some more uh, yeah uh, I would say that opinionated checks. Uh, yeah, it depends if you uh, if you for example yeah. Let's say we are really love immutability of people don't like to introduce Guava dependencies. Well, then you need to disable those if you, uh, yeah, if you don't want to use those. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great talk, Rick. Very coherent. Uh, at the start, you mentioned bike shedding. Yes. So uh, I would hope that, or could you uh, share some data? on whether uh, introducing error-prone has helped you in becoming faster in delivering value or something like that? Did, did it actually help you uh, make more valuable stuff over time? <laughs> hard data on that would be <laughs> quite hard, uh, I would say, if not impossible. Yeah, um, <laughs> I cannot provide any hard data Anecdotal on that, I would say. stories then? Did you notice any uh, <laughs> uptick in performance by teams, for example? We haven't measured it, it to in that uh, granularity, I would say, but uh, yeah, I often get positive uh, reactions from developers, especially if we, because we now release by monthly uh, s uh, cadence, and every month a lot of, uh, well, depending on how many improvements we have, their code gets improved and rewritten, and they're like, oh, thanks for fixing these bugs that we didn't know we had, or like, well, not bugs directly, but could become a bug or could become a problem. Um, yeah, so it's like we keep on continuously improving their code bit by bit. Um, and yeah, they're really happy that they don't need to focus on these things during the code review. So yeah, we get that uh, quite sometimes. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> I have a proxy for that if you want. Uh, check for one line comments in the, Git, uh, the GitHub. Uh, because usually it's like if there's like one small bug, you're like, ah, you're not using is empty here. Then mm -hmm. you, or if it's like, if it's two pages or like more than a par paragraph or more, then it's usually something bigger. But if you can check for like fewer of those one line things, that might be a, like a good proxy for see if it makes the work, uh, the work for you. I believe we have the data. So maybe uh, yeah. next time I can. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your talk. It was, was very interesting. And my next question, well, sorry to be that guy, but is there any support for Kotlin? <laughs> uh, last year at DevOx Belgium, I attended one of the uh, talks of Google, and they, uh, they shifted focus on, uh, on Kotlin quite a bit. And they are working on similar support for this on Kotlin. I, and I also see some related commits in the error-prone repository. But I'm not sure if that will all be open source as well, just like error prone. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm afraid I, I can't make any statements on that. I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, I think the tool is called Android Lint that they're improving. Uh, so you might uh, want to look that up. Okay, that was it. Thank you all again. <laughs>